all of you are really good clappers. <laughs> Listen, if you're ever going to clap for a speaker, like only once ever, <laughs> clap at the start of their talk so they'll feel really great. At the end of their talk, all they're going to think about is the fact that they don't have to talk anymore. So <laughs> it matters, but just, just not as much. Anyways, I digress. We're at the beginning of my talk. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arshia, and I am a member on the community team at Rust. Uh, I'm taking a bit of a break, but when I was on it, I uh, helped run the RustBridge events. Who here knows what RustBridge is? Oh, wow, OK, because I had this whole spiel, but I don't. I, OK, I'm just going to say it anyways. So RustBridge is this all-day workshop, uh, an introductory workshop to RustLang. Uh, and this is geared towards people who are underrepresented in technology. So we run these all-day workshops and get them started with the Rust uh, language, but also the Rust ecosystem. And I've helped run it twice, and I sometimes contribute towards improvements in the curriculum. So that's me. And today I'm going to talk about this idea uh, that I really want to credit Carol with, which is maintaining the Rust community. Um, and I've been thinking increasingly, I've, I've attended two Rust confs, and just watching them change over the past few years has been really interesting. And it's really made me think about how, at this stage of sort of the history of Rust, uh, changes are happening so fast. And we really want to maintain our community in the face of those changes. And I've been thinking about you know, the challenges that we face as these changes come up. So that's what my, what my talk is going to be about. Uh, but I want to start off. Hang on, how do I switch slides? Important question. OK, figured it out. I want to start off with a story, a story about me and how I got started off in Rust. So way, 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 way back in 2017, I'm in my 20s, so 2017 feels like forever ago. Uh, so much has happened. Uh, in early 2017, I attended this conference that was keynoted by Ashley, who spoke at the, the, the keynote this morning. And she talked about this teaching operating system called Intermesos or Intermesos um, in this fun little language called Rust. And I was like, ooh, this is fun. Because at that time, I was taking an operating systems class, and I was loving the heck of it. I, you know, I was learning about like page tables and device drivers and schedulers. And I, I loved all that stuff. And I really wanted to get better at it and you know, sort of uh, you know, explore this in a, in a greater depth and really get into this field and really get good at everything related to operating systems and systems programming in general. The problem was that something got in my way. And that something was this language that I was using to implement my uh, assignments, which were to implement syscalls like fork and exit and so on, in C. And I, I try not to hold extreme opinions about programming languages. And I don't hold an extreme opinion about C. But the fact was that C felt like it was actively getting in my way. Like C had this agenda against me, and C was like, no, you want to learn about an operating system? Well, it sucks for you, because I'm just not going let to you, let you get to that point. And so like, I, I understood that learning C and learning assembly would be a bit of a steep learning curve. And sort of, I was trying to figure out if it was worth it. Right? Steep learning curves are great, because they challenge you. They encourage you to push yourself. But you want to pick your curves. You can't just pick every curve ever and climb all of them. It's just not physically possible. Um, and, and I sort of explored beyond C2. Right? I, I, I looked into Linux and distributed systems. And just sort of all the communities that sort of surround C, which are like grounded in low-level programming. And, it made me realize that even if I mastered the language, what would get in my way after that would be the culture and the environment that surrounded these technologies. And I really felt like I didn't want to fight for a place in those spaces. And I think we can all agree, I'm not really going to try to convince you. You can listen to Ashley's talk. She does try to convince you a little bit that uh, communities centered around low level programming can be pretty gatekeepy. And I just didn't have time for that shit. I was like, OK. And so I like chucked Rust into this bucket of things like knitting and like baking and all the things that I wanted to get really good at. But I was like, nah, it's like just not going to happen for me. And I'm just OK with that in my life. But back to the keynote. So I was, I was listening to this keynote and like looking up uh, this operating system and looking up Rust. And I thought, like, this seems like this could really work for me. Um, it has all these like high level constructs that I already am familiar with. Uh, that I knew from other languages that I could see would make me a better programmer. Um, it had this compiler that you know, uh, said that it would enforce uh, you know, my invariants for me, uh, that would provide sanity checks for me, and uh, would really sort of help me and guide me as I program. And it made me feel like, OK, this is, this is something that I can work on. Um, 
but it wasn't easy, right? Once I got the basics down, it felt like a really steep learning curve. Uh, there was a straight system that I thought I understood, but I didn't really. And then the borrow checker that I thought I understood, but then I didn't really. And then once I got past that, there was like async IO and like lifetimes and like ref cells. I think if I ever complain about Rust, I'll just save ref cell because for me <laughs> specifically, this has been just like a, like a pain point for me. Um, so like it wasn't easy, right? But this curve felt like it was worth it. And the reason that it felt like it was worth it was because of the way that Rust was introduced to me, which was that my introduction to Rust was, was devoid of any sort of expectation that I had to have, I had to have like programmed in some language for some number of years, or that I needed some certain kind of background to be successful in Rust. Side note, the only side note I will ever make in this talk, I feel like this idea that we perpetuate that to be a successful programmer takes anything more than just focus and practice, like you need some inherent magical skill to be a good programmer, is one of the most isolating scams in tech. It's an isolating scam, not just a scam, it's an isolating scam, and it's, it's so awful, and we should do everything we can to sort of counter that myth. Thank you. Oh no, I'm going to rant more now, now that you clap for me. Um, okay. But this was, this was my introduction to Rust. And over the, over the next year, as I talked to people on Twitter and as I talked to uh, you know, my peers, people at RustBridge events, I learned that my experience wasn't that unique, that a lot of people had this exact same experience with Rust, where they, they heard of it, they tried it out, they picked it up, they liked it, they hit a wall, but they wanted to keep pushing at that wall. Um, and that really interested me. And I really feel like for many people who start off programming in Rust, I know there's a fair number of people who are experienced and come in from C++ because they've had their fair share of grief from those languages, but a lot of people want to understand systems and they pick Rust as their first systems language. So two things that really made me want to stick with Rust. The first was this idea that this gut feeling that the Rust community felt very intentionally constructed to be inclusive. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is like, I didn't know anyone in Rust at the time. All I had was, you know, access to like their GitHub, their issue tracker, and like, you know, the, any online resources that I could see. Um, I didn't personally know anyone in Rust. But there were so many big and little things about Rust that I encountered, like the language used in the official book, uh, the code of conduct, uh, the way that issue triage was done. And I like use Twitter a lot. And so do Rust people, it turns out. That was like really great for me. Um, and so all these little things made me feel like there was a lot of care uh, put into sort of the construction of this community. The second was that in 2017, Rust was kind of new. Not like super new, like I know it was post 1.0, but it felt kind of new to me. And when communities are new, they have a very different kind of potential. They're in this like uncharted territory and all these like decisions have to be made that are hugely relevant to the future of that community. And to me, a community is really all about its people, right? The people who choose to join, the people who choose to leave, the people who choose to stay. And this challenge of creating a programming community, uh, creating this a community of programmers who, who reject gatekeeping, who value mentorship, programmers who don't all look like each other, it's such a hard challenge. And I really wanted to be in a community in which that challenge didn't feel insurmountable. And so Rust was small and Rust was new and Rust showed me that it was taking some positive steps in that direction. And so Rust made me want to stay. And this was like the beginning of my like foray into Rust, right? Mm. But as I, as I you know, participated more in the Rust community, got to know people who were in the working groups, uh, lurked around in RFCs a lot, I could see that this instinct that I had about this intentional construction it's like so funny how the opening keynote talked about like being deliberate and I was like, oh my God, I'm talking about intentional construction. Um, it's like, it's very nice how they're complimentary in that way. Um, but yeah, I could see how this like instinct I had about intentional construction uh, ended up being really true because this, uh, this approach was baked into a lot of the norms and a lot of the processes in the Rust community. And just a simple example of this, I think, is the RFC process. Um, and I know all of you can think of like your favorite like contentious RFC. Oh my God, RFC 5298, like it never got closed, et cetera. Um, and I know the RFC process isn't perfect, but what I wanna talk about is how I feel like the core team has evolved the RFC process 
um, because they want to keep its alignment with the goals of Rust, which is to be open, which is to listen to the Rust community, which is to incorporate their feedback and really uh, you know, create this culture of, of, of trust. Um, and so I heard about this as I was like sort of researching the stock, um, where a few years ago there was a lot of frustration within the Rust community where they felt like decisions were made in RFCs uh, based off of rationale that wasn't publicly expressed in threads. And so they were like, hey, what the hell, man? Like, we didn't know about this. And you just went off and made this decision on your own. And so the core team like really listened and really came back and said, we have this new rule where if we make a decision, it will be based off of you know, public debate in threads that everyone can see and comment on. And I just thought that was a really, uh, really, uh, really profound example. Um, and as I was researching this more, I came across, across this quote on Aaron's website. And I'm going to read the whole quote out to you because that is how his words should be treated sometimes. Um, the Rust community prides itself on being a friendly and welcoming place, but it is going to take constant, explicit work to keep it that way. And part of that work is being forthright about the cases where things have gotten less than friendly, pausing and working together to figure out why. So the reason I love this quote so much, yes, thank you. The reason I love this quote so much is that it doesn't even just apply to the IFCs. This like applies to so much more than, it, it applies to sort of the overall culture in Rust. And as someone who isn't, like I'm not on the core team, I'm not in a working group, I don't, I'm in school, I'm like really not contributing to Rust open source a lot, so I have a very different view of the Rust community. And I want to argue that these top level decisions, this uh, approach that you see at the top level of the Rust community has this sort of like trickle down effect that you can see. And so it has a positive impact on the experience of someone who's only been doing Rust for a few hours or, few, or for a few days. And I think that's really great about the Rust community. But this is only going to get harder. I'm not saying it hasn't been hard yet. It's, it's been pretty hard. The, the, the whole keynote this morning was about how Things are not easy. People are hard and working with them is like a non-trivial challenge. But I think that as more and more people start writing Rust, we're going to face some new challenges. The first challenge has to do with our values, right? So I feel like Rust has a pretty simple set of values um, and we've done a fairly good job of like articulating them at least. Uh, you know, no gatekeeping, celebrating our differences instead of using them as grounds for inclusion. Uh, discouraging zero-sum thinking, uh, encouraging humility and empathy, and so on. But I feel like as the community grows, it is going to be harder to diffuse these values and spread this message to everyone who decides to start programming in Rust. And I was telling this to my friend yesterday, and she was like, this is like when you put a Skittle in the water. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, so apparently, when you put a Skittle in the water, the color will like drain out of it and it'll go into the water and diffuse through the water, but it won't be even like, you know, like when you have a drop of ink in the water or something. Um, you can see that the color is like the most intense at the center and then it just gets like less and less intense uh, around the periphery. So what I'm really saying is that our rust values are like the colors of Skittles um, in this like weird analogy. Um, so the growth of a community is a great thing, right? Like it's good that people are adopting rust more and more. Uh, but I think along with that growth, we have to think about how we are communicating our values because subgroups and, and sub-communities and pockets will inevitably form. But we really want to do all that we can to make sure that those pockets are grounded in these, these basic values of kindness and consideration. Um, and I was talking about uh, this with, with Manish. Like a lot of people have you know, brainstormed this like, talk with me. And he pointed out that it's worth thinking about how the Rust community is changing now as opposed to a few years ago. And the Rust community is no longer just uh, a group of people who like really, really like memory safe programming languages or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, it's a mature community that plenty of businesses and organizations have you know, derived value out of, like commercial value out of. Um, and this is great, but this means that plenty of newcomers to the language are learning Rust I mean, a lot of them are learning Rust out of self-interest because they really think that, you know, they're really excited by this new model of like memory management or something. But a lot of them are also starting to program in Rust because they happen to join a company in which the code base is in Rust. Or they're starting to work on a project on, you know, which is written in Rust and so on. And this means that it is entirely possible that people who start programming in Rust will not necessarily align with our values. They might, they might in fact disagree with our values and be like, all right, I'm gonna program in Rust, they're not gonna care, et cetera. 
And I think that has really interesting implications for the composition of our community moving forward. And it's just really important to keep that in mind and understand that dynamic. The second uh, set of challenges I think we're going to face uh, is that of diversity. So like, I actually want to wanna ask all of you, how many of you think that with respect to like, other communities, Rust does like, a really good job of encouraging participation? Yeah, like, I, I do too. That's great. How many of you feel like that's still not good enough? OK, great. I'm really glad I don't have to like, do the work of like, convincing all of you. Um, and the State of the Rust survey provides some pretty uh, good data as to this as well. Uh, this is data from 2017, and according to the, the Rust website, uh, it pretty much looked like this in 2016 as well. Uh, and it's something that you'll notice if you start to attend a lot of Rust events, which I do, which is that uh, we're a pretty homogenous group. And it would be pretty unfortunate if years from now we continue to stay this homogenous. I think like, that would really upset me, and uh, it would, you know, it wouldn't make for uh, healthy participation. But it's also useful to think about, like, how did we get here? Like, what happened? Like, we started off, like, as a, as a little, you know, what was the keynote? Like, in the beginning, there was the void. And then, like, Rust happened. And then people started joining. Um, and how did we get here, like, n years later? Well, there's two reasons, I think. The first is that Rust is primarily a systems programming language. and Systems has such a legacy, uh, you know, starting from like the 70s or the 60s or whatever, and that does tend to skew uh, towards the, the white male demographic. For another, open source communities themselves aren't very diverse because being able to commit the time and energy that you need to actively and, uh, you know, impactfully contribute to a community is something that not everyone can do. Um, and I was thinking about this during the opening keynote, where there was this idea that, you know, his, like, over the past year or so in Rust, we've moved really fast. And that's been really good for us. But that that's come at a cost. And I think I would like to argue that one of the costs that we've had to pay is the diversity of our community. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I feel like we're at this like inflection point where we're not so big that it's going, it's this mammoth, completely impossible task to make our community more diverse. But we're big enough that if we don't think of new concrete ways of addressing the problem, it will soon become much harder than it is right now. And, I'm, and I've been thinking about like ways we can address this. Like I don't want this talk to just be a dump of like everything sucks and we don't know what to do. And I've been thinking about this idea of points of entry into Rust, like the ways that people enter the Rust community. Um, so like I said, I run these Rust Bridge, I've run two Rust Bridge uh, uh, workshops uh, over the past year. And something that I've noticed is that a lot of the people who come to Rust have a significant amount of experience in some other language, like Java or JavaScript and so on. So naturally, when they start to learn Rust, they'll try to map what they know in those languages to Rust. Um, and they'll do this even for features of Rust, you know, that don't necessarily have an analog, like the borrow checker and so on. So what we need is more resources that say, hey, you, you have this super valuable and super useful experience. Let's use that to get you started with Rust. Instead of starting them off with like, oh, this is the way garbage collection is, even though you don't know, like, even though you've come from like this language that doesn't have garbage collection at all. Um, and we were talking about this a few weeks ago. Uh, just before I took a break from the community team. Um, and we were thinking of this idea of modifying the Rustbridge curriculum, where we have code examples for concepts like enums and optionals and so on in common languages that people typically know, like JavaScript or Java. And we provide like analogous code examples in Rust. And in doing this, we really recognize that they come from a certain space and that we're going to use that space to get them uh, started off in Rust. Um, some other great, uh, some other en uh, entry points into Rust that have helped me that I recommend to other people are uh, Rust by Example, uh, the second edition of the Rust book, which we all uh, know and love. Um, but they they don't have to be the only point of entry. So so here is my like call to action for all of you: create your own point of entry into Rust. Think about uh, how you first learned Rust. Think about the way that you would have liked to learn Rust, and teach people that way. And you, know, you might be thinking that uh, the way you would teach borrow semantics or the way that you would teach the difference between a cell and ref cell would only make sense to you and maybe a few others. Um, but what, or, or you might think that you, know, you could use like, the docs to, to learn like, what, 
when to use cell and when to use ref cell. But what those other resources and what those docs lack is your perspective and your background. And I really want to tell you that that is like what is going to make your, that resource so powerful. The greater the variety we have in the learning resources in the REST community, the more powerful we will be because the more people we'll be able to attract and sort of cater to. And not only will this make it easier for people to learn Rust, but it will also normalize this idea that I am really invested in, and I think you should all also be really invested in, which is that systems programming is for anyone and everyone. You don't have to start off with assembly, C, C++, and Rust. You can start off with JavaScript, Rust, Ruby, Rust. Pick your favorite language um, and Rust. And I think that we can, we can all agree that that idea needs to be a bit more pervasive uh, in the tech community. So. I love conferences. I love them. <laughs> I've attended them, and I've been really, really lucky to get to, to speak at them. Uh, I've emceed them <laughs> somehow, and I've even organized them. And I think that conferences have such an incredible amount of value. Uh, you know, Rust, my first introduction to Rust happened at a conference. Some of the uh, closest people that I, I know in the, in the tech space I met at a conference. Um, and I also really love small conferences. Small conferences are the best, OK? Uh, these are some of my favorite conferences. Uh, this Bang Bang Con on, the, on, on this end, which is a, a small conference run in uh, New York. Check them out. The one at that end is a conference that I organize, uh, which is in, in Canada, by the way. And the one in the middle is this conference called Rust Belt Rust. It runs in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, <laughs> And as someone who attends many conferences and workshops and so on, I increasingly feel like small and localized events have their own kind of power, right? They're less intimidating to newcomers. Uh, they make it easier for people to form connections and make, make new friends and to sort of get to know each other. Um, it also makes for a better learning experience if all you're there to do is to learn uh, you know, how a certain technology works. And they're also less expensive to organize. And since they're less expensive to organize, that means we can have more of them, which is great because tech events can be pretty inaccessible if you don't have the ability to take time off from a job or if you don't have the money to travel to a whole different city or a whole other country to attend a conference. Now, as Rust grows in size, our events will as well. Um, it's, it's reasonable and maybe also a little exciting to think of how in a few years Rust conferences will be, you know, multi-day, will have multiple tracks. And that's like, like, I would love to attend a conference like that. But at the same time, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that small uh, events like this have an incredible amount of value. And I will keep attending small conferences. Um, and Rustbridge is a great example of this. So most Rustbridges are like under 25 to 30 people. Uh, the first Rustbridge I ran had like five people, which was like actually the best. And I really think that the power of Rustbridge lies in its size. Uh, we usually end up with a pretty high student to TA, to TA ratio. And so the students end up learning Rust, but they also really end up engaging with these people who've been doing Rust for a little bit longer. They get to hear from their experiences and they get to hear about the Rust like ecosystem and the Rust community as a whole. So it's like, it's not really like Rust the language they're learning, but it's Rust the community they're joining. And I think that's so, so valuable. And so given that Rustbridge is so impactful and given that the best Rustbridges are small, the only way to multiply the effect of Rustbridges is to run your own Rustbridge. <laughs> so here's my second call to action, or my third, I forget, my second, probably my second, um, is to run a Rustbridge in your own city. If you know some basic Rust, and I'm pretty sure most of you probably do, uh, get in touch with the community team and ask how you can run a Rust bridge uh, in your city. We'll help you with the curriculum. You can modify it if you want. Uh, we'll help you with logistics, advertising, food, whatever you want. We just want people running more Rust bridges. But why stop there? So like I said before, think about what you know and where you came from and use that to organize an event that hasn't been done before. Most of the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the technical events that we have around Rust are meetups, workshops at conferences, and Rust bridges. But I want to go beyond that. Like, what if we had a contribution workshop where you had first-time uh, contributors to Rust come up, and they were mentored through their first contribution to an open source workshop? That would be an incredible amount of work, but I feel like that would be so impactful and so useful. So I would, I would love to see someone organize that. Um, another idea I had was a capture the flag event in which like each challenge is like a rust related thing and it doesn't even have to be programming related. It can be like, what was the crate that is used for command line argument parsing? Clap. 
I mean, no, no, don't clap for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so here's my second call to action for you. Run a Rust event that hasn't been run before. Think about the kind of event that you would like to see, and it takes some work, it takes some effort, it takes some initiative, it takes some, some money. Uh, but I would really love to see more of this happening, and not just like you know, in North America. But why stop there? <laughs> Does anyone know where I'm going with this? I hope you don't. Um, so it wasn't long ago that I was at a conference, the same conference uh, where I was introduced to Rust uh, by the keynote that Ashley gave. Uh, and I was like thinking about the program and like how I'd improve it and how you know, I wish that things were done that way and not, not that way. And I just turned to my friends and I was like, let's run a conference, yo. And they were like, okay. And a year later we ran it and it was great. And that's us right there last year. And, and we're running it again in 2019. Uh, and we'll probably keep running it a few more times. Uh, it's called StarCon, by the way, if any of you are interested. Uh, but my point is, uh, I'm not really trying to plug Stark on here. Our Twitter handle is star, C-O-N, by the way, if you want to <laughs> follow us. Um, but, but it wasn't a lot, it wasn't as much work as I thought it would be. It was definitely a lot of hard work. It required a lot of outreach, a lot of initiative. But we got it done, and we were all just undergrads. So I'm sure some of you can get this done, too. So here is my last call to action for you. Run a Rust conference. Some basic things, okay, before you like shake your head and go like, oh my god, she is like a lot. Um, some basic things you need to run a conference are a name. It's easy. It doesn't take like more than 15, 20 minutes to come up with a solid name. A team of really excited organizers who like, you know, just as excited, at, uh, just as, excited as me about conferences. Um, a venue, where do you want to hold your conference, and a date. And then you need like food and money and speakers. But like that will follow once you have this like starter pack that I've given to you now. So go off and run your own Rust, Rust conferences. I'm not saying it's going to be a cakewalk. Um, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. But it is incredibly rewarding. As someone who has like run her own conference, I am telling all of you that it is incredibly rewarding to run your own. Um, and it's been done before. And like I said, conferences can be really inaccessible. So the more we have, the better it is for everyone. So I really want to wrap up by saying that what attracted me to Rust was the language. Uh, like, I cannot tell you when I, what went through my head when I was like a systems programming language with like math statements. Like, how even? This is so amazing. But what made me want to stay was the community itself. And it requires a lot of non-trivial work to evangelize our core values and then to follow up that evangelism with concrete actions. But this is the sense of purpose that we need to move with if we want Rust to be different than all the other systems programming communities that preceded. And you can quote me on that. So that's all I have. Thank you very much.